So then I was good at a few things. It started to have this idea that if we apply these same principles, we can change the world. And then at that point, it became the insular society. Uh, and then as happens with insular societies, the power starts to be in the hands of too few. How many musicians do you know that grew up in a cult? And starts some time around midnight. I love doing true crime stories, but I'm also a music junkie. Uh, I used to be a music writer for many, many years, and the Airborne Toxic event has been a band I've followed since their inception. That band has played nearly every major festival around the world. They're super famous, and it's been cool to be sort of like a fly on the wall watching their success. I spoke to Mikel Jolet, the lead singer of the Airborne Toxic event. Come time to do a story on this singer of this band that I really admire, who I thought, after 15 years of covering them, I knew everything about this group. I'm even quoted in an unauthorized biography that have been put out about them. I've interviewed him numerous times over the years, and I knew nothing. His past is unlike anything I've ever heard before. He grew up in a cult. Essentially, he was born inside an orphanage, which was inside a cult in California in the 70s. And he's just chronicled it in his best-selling autobiography, Hollywood Park. And it's a wild, wild ride. In fact, it's almost as if like him being a musician is a footnote in the whole story. It's not so much that I set out to write a book about you know, cults and families and addiction and the search for true love, which is what my book is about. Mm -hmm. Um, it's that I really wanted to write a book that that dealt with my sort of biggest joys and deepest struggles, and those, those things just happened to be the, to be that. Synanon is a real corporation. Its business is junkies. Synanon was a place that started for a bunch of dope fiends in the '60s to get clean off of heroin. That's really what it started as. You know, and they didn't think AA went far enough for heroin addicts. So they wanted to have a more sort of intense version of that. Um, and that's what they did. And then and then it worked for a long time, a good 10, 15 years. It, it, it helped a lot of people uh, get clean off heroin. My dad had done some time in prison. And when he got out, he had a heroin addiction that he'd established in jail. And someone dropped, he OD'd, and then someone dropped him off uh, at Synanon. And then he got clean. Synanon was good at a few things. And then what happened was it, uh, lifestylers started moving in, the, the non-addicts, what they called the squares. Those were people, a lot of them were intellectuals and activists, and that's what my, my mom was. My mom was a free speech activist from Berkeley. I don't even think she drank, uh, but she moved in to change the world because it started to have this idea that if we apply these same principles, we can change the world. And then at that point, it became the insular society. Uh, and then as happens with insular societies, the power starts to be in the hands of too few. There's this leader named Chuck and Chuck started doing all this crazy stuff. Chuck became this megalomaniacal leader who was violent. He basically ruled with an iron fist and said, like, if anyone double crosses me, you're going to pay the ultimate price. Chuck Dietrich is the ex-drunk who dreamed it up and fights to keep it from becoming a nightmare. Get out of that car and shut up. Stand over there. Put your hands against the wall. Get in that cell and stay there. But nobody tells me what to do. It's not a fun place. It's a scary place. He forced the people that live there to have shaved heads. He forced children. So in Mikel Jolet's situation, his birth mother had him and his brother, uh, who was a few years older than him, and they never knew each other. So like he knew his brother by face, but not that that was his relative. In fact, he didn't know what a relative was. He didn't know what the word mother or father meant. The parents were never allowed to see their kids. So that's why he essentially was born inside an orphanage. And then around the time he was four or five, this person came up to him and she's like, you know, I'm your mom. Um, and we were like, what's a mom? We didn't, you know, we didn't know what a mom was. But uh, we had to escape, so we left with her. We lived on the run for a while. And uh, a lot of different things happened to us along the way. And what I'd say is that I, that kid that I was never had a voice. No one ever stopped and asked us how we, how we felt about these events. Considering how chaotic and 
wildly, you know, insane his childhood upbringing was inside the Synanon walls, Jolet's done really well for himself. He graduated Stanford University with honors. He was a journalist. He started a rock and roll band uh, in a time when the music industry was quickly on the decline. And who starts a rock and roll band when no one's really listening to rock and roll? And he's done really well. And then when the book came out, it was a complete sucker punch because I did not know any of that. I did not know any of your backstory in that regard. So what compelled you to finally tell it? Um, my, my dad died. That, my, I would just say it's probably that was the initiating event. And, you know, it hit me really hard. And, and I, I, I was trying to figure out why um, it hit me so hard. And I, I think initially I set out to write kind of a, a family memoir about his life, short 30,000 words. I had read Between the World and Me, Ta-Nehisi Kosit's book. The style of the book is that he, he writes it as a letter to his son. And I mm -hmm. thought, God, what a great, what a great idea. And I, it was just such a brilliant book. And I thought, okay, um, how can I write about my experiences? Maybe as a letter to my dad. And then as I got into it, you know, I realized more and more I, was, I wanted to do something different, which was this sort of first person unpacking of all these different uh, lies that I'd been told throughout my life. And to give voice to this kid that I, that I was, that my brother and I were, uh, who never really had, had voices. Now knowing that there was a darker story that I had, that myself and so many people around him, including close friends, had no idea about, I'm really, really thrilled that I got a chance to speak to him after the book was published, just to hear that he's doing all right. And in a year where no one's doing okay, I'm happy this guy's doing all right. This is Inside Edition Digital.